Okay, next um, is our monthly budget report, and we have our finance director, Deborah Jacobson. You're taking the point, and again, we're excusing um, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones. So we're, 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 it's going to be great hearing from our finance director, Deborah Jacobson. You ready to join us? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, okay, every month we're required um, to basically give you a status on the health of our financials. Um, so in your backups, again, you will, as always, you'll see um, a monthly budget report that is broken out by not only section, but by program and by state and federal funding. Um, this particular report you'll see is actually month ending January 31st, 2001. Um, there's always a delay, a month delay there um, due to the fact that the timing of month end close processes and when board backups are due. Um, so we're always kind of a month behind. But I am here to testify today that USBE continues to be financially sound and um, has the ability to cover all current and future obligations. So um, with that, I'll just open it up to any questions. Okay, questions from board members re regarding our monthly budget report. I'm not seeing any hands raised and thanks for putting those in the back up and thanks for your statement on us being financially sound. Sure, if there's no questions and under your direction, if we can move to the discretionary report. Let's move to the discretionary funds report. So again, we always every month kind of go through, this is what um, um, has occurred due to carry forward from years past um, that's under the board's discretion to, um, oh, there it is, sorry. I can't see that report. It's a little. Um, so we give you a monthly check on where this stands based on. So you'll see up in the upper right hand corner is where we initially started at the beginning of 2021. Um, by way of a whole closeout process on the left hand side of the report are um, programs or projects that the board has approved. And then of course, you can see that um, where we stand on that as things are spent and what's remaining in those projects. So with that, if there are any questions. Any, any questions from board members on the discretional fund report? And I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, and that ends the discretionary report. So if we can recognize um, Director Sarah Young for her report on the CARES funding. Before I recognize uh, Director uh, Young, thank you, um, Director Jacobson, for filling in for Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones. I know you look forward to this quite <laughs> often. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna lie, I'm having a little bit of a deja vu moment. <laughs> So, so thank you for filling in and, and being prepared and your good work. So thank you. Next, we'll thank turn you. the time over to Director of Strategic Initiative, um, Sarah Young. Are you ready thank, to present? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Jerry, if it would be possible for me to share my screen, I'll put the presentation up. Well, I, I'm sure somebody's got the controls there that's going to do that for you. Yep, I am okay. ready to go. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Um, Sarah Young, Director of Strategic Initiatives for the State Board of Education, presenting our monthly update on CARES funding for K-12 education to the State Board. So when we talk about CARES funding as a friendly reminder, um, it is an ever-growing pot of um, different individual funding streams that will have different guidance coming from different entities at the federal government, as well as through some of our state legislative efforts um, to provide coronavirus relief efforts in the K-12 setting. You'll see um, all of the different awards that we're going to touch on here today. Uh, the first one being the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Act. We will also touch on the Governor's uh, Emergency Education Relief Award, 
our coronavirus relief awards, which are broken down into different use cases. Um, we'll provide you an update on ESSER II or the second uh, wave of funding that came in December, um, as well as on touching on some of the other programs that the State Board has engaged in. So you'll see on this slide, we've given you a breakdown of each of the individual awards. The second column is going to speak to the total amount of funding that was awarded to the State Board of Education through each of these opportunities. The second call or the third column, pardon me, is going to speak to the amount that we have reimbursed to our local education agency awardees as of February 24th. Last but not least, showing a percentage of uh, those funds as compared to the total award. You'll note that the K-12 broadband grant has been closed. Um, so we've received all of the reimbursements that we will for that particular program. Those that are highlighted in green are those that are using coronavirus relief funding, meaning that our awardees have until the close of this fiscal year, June 30th, 2021, to be able to expend, obligate, and seek reimbursement specific to those awards. As far as ESSER II goes, um, we have moved forward with the uh, re-awarding of that grant to the field. So as you may remember when we presented last time, we were in the process of issuing the ESSER II awards and receiving applications from the field when um, there was some state intent language that was placed um, in terms of additional guidance related to our LEAs and how they spent those funds. At that that time the agency paused our application process and waited until the end of um, the outcomes of the legislative session to then be able to reissue the application to the field so that our LEAs when applying have clarity on the expectations not just from the federal level but from the state level as well. Those are due to the State Board of Education um, by March 31st of this year and we'll be able to provide you an update, um, most likely in your May board meeting, related to how those funds will be spent um, by the LEAs based on those plans. So as far as the timeline goes, again, um, our award letter was received on January 6th. We began the initial issue, reissuing of the grants um, on February 11th, giving our LEAs additional time to be able to submit their application. In addition, um, we are still working with the governor's office on the emergency education relief fund that came through in the December federal COVID relief funding. Um, so we will continue to provide you updates, but that award has not been issued to the larger community um, as we continue to look at outcomes from legislative session and the needs that our LEAs are facing moving forward. The second pro or the third program I would say that was within that particular uh, December effort is the emergency assistance for non public schools. And so I'm pleased to let you know that um, that application is live. It was released on March 1st of 2021. We're running two rounds of application for our non-public school partners. Um, the first one is due to our office by April 30th of this year. And that is one where our non-public schools can seek reimbursement for specific federally allowable expenses related to their response to COVID-19. The second round of applications will be released after that, and that'll give those schools an opportunity to seek for future services through the State Board of Education and or future reimbursement for additional expenditures as they move forward. We do have this information posted on our coronavirus website and have been working with our communications team to be able to make sure it's promoted to the broader community so that all of our non-public schools know about this particular grant and can engage with USBE on seeking those resources. Last but not least, this is an update. Um, so you should know that our agency is tracking the American Rescue Plan Act um, or ARPA for 2021. This is the um, newest federal um, action related to COVID-19 relief that is pending the uh, president's signature currently, which we expect to happen on Friday. Within the bill that is being considered is um, $122.8 billion related to K-12 state edu education agencies. 
Um, and it's important to note that there are some differences related to this new funding as compared to the previous uh, funding efforts that we've received at the office. Specifically, um, the current bill language states that um, the state set aside is required to be spent in specific percentages on expenditures related to learning loss, summer enrichment, and after school programs. So that'll be an additional piece of guidance that we'll need to follow as a state agency in regards to how the state set aside moves forward into the community. In addition to that, you'll note that the legislation calls for our LEAs to use 20% of their awards, which are based on the Title I um, allocations that have been used in the previous ESSER I and ESSER II distributions. 20% of that award will need to be spent to address learning loss within their individual communities. We will wait for the US Department of Education to issue um, an official award along with budget allocation tables, as well as additional guidance related to this new legislation. But we wanted to give you a preview um, of what staff is uh, seeing in the current legislation um, just for your information. I'll also note that the funding is not just directed at K-12. We also have funding within that bill that will be going to the institutions of higher education. And then an additional round of funding will be made available to governors related to um, the private schools or non-public schools, very similar to the EANS program um, that I just spoke about that we're already administering. With that, Chair, I'm happy to take any questions or provide any clarification, but this concludes my report on CARES um, for this month. Um, questions from or comments from board members, uh, Vice Chair Belknap. Um, yes, Chair, I actually have three, but I'll wait my turn if someone else raises their hand. So my, fir my first question is the state requirements for ESSER two, what are they that are due on March 31st? Do you have that listing somewhere, Sarah? I can't remember what was changed in the bill. Hey, sorry. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Vice Chair Belknap. So it is posted on our website, um, but I can say that the clarification was originally um, we have the list of 14 allowable use cases that are presented by our federal partners. And then in addition to that, the state intent language was specific that the funds had to be spent on learning loss or it would impact the local education agencies um, state allocation related to the, um, the public education dollars that were coming their way. They have since revised that to align with the federal use cases, um, but they specifically called out that that same um, reverse match would occur if an LEA was to spend on capital expenditures or HVAC. So effectively, yeah. those are the two use cases that were removed from the federal list um, in terms of our LEAs and their applications. So it's just those two, thank you. And Chair, one more, and then okay. I'll back hey, let me off. Jump to these others, then I'll jump to you. You have three, okay? Okay. I'll come back to you. Um, Board Member Klein. Um, yes, I just had a question about the 2.75 billion uh, to the governors for private school. Is that gonna cause issues with um, requiring private schools to follow federal mandates that come with federal dollars? Chair, if I may. Yeah, Director Young. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Board Member Klein. So in regards to um, accepting these awards, it's actually um, going to be the same program, just a second round of what we're currently administering through this emergency assistance for non-public schools. Um, so a few pieces in regards to federal requirements. Because we are required to maintain control um, of the federal funding through a public entity, um, none of these schools, uh, non-public schools, are technically federal awardees. Um, we are responsible as their SEA for the public maintenance of those funds. So what it means is, is that they have to follow the federal guidance related to the program. For example, they cannot have received a payroll protection program loan um, after December 27th. 
Um, however, that is all presented up front before they apply for the application. They do not have um, additional regulations and requirements that are placed on them afterwards because we as the SEA are the recipient um, and fiscally responsible for those funds. Chair Huntsman, if I could add to that, if I may. Yeah, okay. Board Member Klein, if you are asking about some of the academic uh, requirements related to the Elementary Secondary Education Act funds, meaning uh, uh, participating in assessments, accountability, those kinds of things. Those funds are very separated and they're they're not interrelated at all. And that might be what you're asking. Maybe I'm misinterpreting. Okay, thank you. That helps. Okay, um, Board Member Earl. Thank you. I'm so I'm trying to understand this. So we've we've got several millions of dollars that were not spent yet, but we've got more millions of dollars that are coming to help us. And we're supposed to focus on um, after school programs, summer school programs, and then learning loss. Um, what's the, I guess I'm trying to understand, maybe it's a little frustrating that we've got so much money and we've got do you know what I mean? Which is, that sounds really crazy. We shouldn't even be saying that. But at the same time, I, there, there seems to be a balance. When that money goes away, where do those programs go and who is going to be funding those programs? Or do people know this is maybe only a temporary two-year, you know, in, expansion of, of schools or learning? Director Young? <laughs> That's thank my you, chair. So thank you, board member Earl. Um, in regards to these funds, when we are um, issuing these funds through application to the community, we are very clear that they are one-time funds. Um, and so we are also very clear on the expectations around the federal award and how long we have to be able to spend these funds related to that award period. Um, as far as um, these individual efforts um, related to not just learning loss, but summer enrichment and after school programs, I think it's really important to note that they all have to be targeted specific to responding to impacts due to COVID-19. So as we move forward, um, I believe the the intent um, and the hope of the community is that um, these are needs that we have right now due to COVID-19, but that as we move further away from the impacts of the pandemic, hopefully those um, impacts lessen because we're able to address them using these resources and that it will not be an ongoing need in perpetuity. So, so it is limited. Did you have a follow-up board member Earl? Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Belknap, you had two additional questions. Thank you. I don't think they'll be too long. Okay, so one is where when money goes to the non-public school K-12, is it K-12 only or could that include preschool? So I will have to get back to you on that. I know that the U.S. Department of Education has issued guidance related to those um, expenses that are allowable. Um, I will note that in regards to um, the use cases themselves, they're really pretty broad to a school community. They're not really specific to an individual grade level. So it would be possible um, for a school community that serves maybe preschool as part of a larger K-12 system to use those resources to meet those needs. Um, I'm just not, um, and, and would want to double check before saying that it applies okay. to only preschools. All right, thank you, um, Chair. Go my next one, Chair. Next question. On the $122.8 billion for the K-12, do we, have you, has the office uh, taken a look at the plans for distribution of those funds yet? How that would be distributed? Chair, if I may? Yes, Director Young. So in regards to um, the allocations that have been published in the legislation, uh, this money will be um, overseen by the US Department of Education. They will not release um, official state allocation tables until the bill is effectively signed um, by the president. And so um, we do have estimates um, related to um, what we would expect to see based on the, um, I guess the, allocation methods that they're using. Um, and we would expect it to be um, a little over double what we received from the December distribution. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Um, board Member Moss. 
This is, thank you, Chair. And let me put my hand down before I start so I don't forget at the end there. Um, this is sort of a moving target question, but what is our best source of knowledge from within our office about what's worked best so far in COVID learning loss recovery? And, and how are we using that to guide uh, this distribution to the extent that we have any, any say in that? Chair, if I may. So thank you for that question, board member Moss. Um, in regards to um, the kind of outcomes related to learning loss, um, I think that there's kind of two, two key parts to your question. So we as an agency um, are certainly going to be looking at outcomes related to the upcoming state assessments to really help inform um, where we are. That's gonna be a very important data set related to then being able to look at the strategies that those communities um, have implemented related to where their students are. Um, so in a way, we don't have that data set just yet to be able to make that type of comparative analysis across different plans um, as they've occurred. The second part to that question in regards to distribution. Um, so the federal legislation dictates that um, a state distributes 90% of this money based on uh, Title IA allocations. And so when we create the projections for awards, that component of 90% of the money that's coming in is already predetermined. And then the State Board of Education has authorities and decision-making that's related to um, the remaining 10% of those funds, noting that in this federal legislation and there is some additional guidance um, that will be coming on how that 10% needs to be spent. Do you have a follow-up, Board Member Moss? No, thank you. So, so and that, I'm, I'm sure that data is gonna be coming to us, but the LEAs, a lot of the LEAs that were on the Hill and participating in a lot of the legislative discussions, they, the, it's, they've asked that, there's a lot of flexibility on how this span, spending will happen because not all LEAs are created equal and they have strength, they, they can capitalize on the strength that they have in their LEAs and they can work on their, their weaknesses, but most of them have, in that space, they're, they're looking at their summer bridge, the extended days and extended resources um, as a form of mitigation, but they really have been aggressively asking for a lot of flexibility as they approach using it, knowing and using their existing resources and also knowing uh, uh, external resources that are out there. So I just throw that in. I, that was a really good question. And then that question was on the Hill a lot also. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Director Young? No, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands Raised, appreciate the update. We'll be getting more updates as this as this rolls out. Um, before I go, I just want to say this: I I can't go anywhere uh, in the state amongst all these LEAs that don't have a great deal of appreciation um, for Director Young and staff in rolling out these funds and and using these funds uh, to make education happen. And and yes, not all the funds are spent. But the funds that have been spent have been very much appreciated and, and such a good use. So, uh, thank you, Director Young. It's just kudos to you. I just you're you're very well known, <laughs> and, and your in your quick response through this pandemic, where they just can't drive to your office and walk in and, and have a visit with you. So, thank you for your work and your effort, Superintendent. Um, let's see. I don't see any other hands. Okay, we're moving on. 